Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you all this morning. I'm uh, Pastor Jeff. I lead our creative team here, and what a privilege it is to be with you this morning. And thanks for being here on this uh, Sunday, where it looks like we might be missing a few folks because of the football playoffs or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> I see some jerseys and some, uh, you know, NFL paraphernalia. That's good. We love that around here at Bridge Church. Hey, speaking of Super Bowl Sunday coming up, um, we are having church. I feel like we should say that. Uh, but man, if you have a shirt or a jersey or a hat or a scarf or whatever, wear it. We thought it would be fun to see all that represented and who likes what team and stuff. So make sure to come wearing that on Super Bowl Sunday if you got it. Uh, hey, anyway, as we launch in here, I want to offer you the reminder, uh, as I have several times in recent weeks, that we have so much good stuff going on as we launch into a new year together here at Bridge Church. And we can't talk about all of it all the time in our gatherings, uh, but the best way to know about it is by putting our Bridge Church app on your device or by heading over to our website. Those things are always up to date and have all the great stuff going on as we launch into 22 and the things you can be part of and get signed up for. So make sure and head over to our website or, or the app there and, and see what's going on there. This morning, we are in week number two of our Rooted launch series. We're talking about Rooted a lot around here. It is a 10-week experience starting the first week in February designed to help us drill down super deep in our knowledge of the Bible and in our intentional choosing day by day, week by week, to live out the way of Jesus as we find it in the Bible. And we're doing this in the context of groups of like six to 10 people. So some of us are in groups that are doing Rooted. We're, we're deciding to pause what we regularly do to be part of this experience. And my wife and I are in a group like that. We're going to be doing Rooted, and we're super excited about it. And just, you know, we've both been walking with Jesus a long time, but we're just excited for the refreshing that could come by going back to the basics and drilling deep there. If you're not in a group, now is the time. Uh, get, get registered and get in a Rooted group. And, you know, as Pastor Andrew opened this up for us last Sunday, the really what we're doing here on Sunday morning last week and this Sunday is we're answering these two questions. Why, why does Bridge Church believe so strongly in us going through the rooted experience and the fact that it could provide transformation in our lives? And why should I be part of it? So last week, Pastor Andrew was talking about our need for repentance and forgiveness and what it looks like to obey Jesus, to live lives of obedience and devotion to Jesus and how prayer and generosity work in that. And this morning, we've got two areas, uh, two more areas where we want to set up what we will experience together through those 10 weeks in Rooted by talking about what the Bible has to say about it this morning. And one of them is what it looks like. What does Jesus have to say about a lifestyle of serving others and why that's important? That's, that's become increasingly counterintuitive, right, in our culture where it's, boy, it is so easy and we're even encouraged to, to look out for us, number one, and our families and our own relationships. And Jesus, once again, he's going to prove to be countercultural. But there's another piece we need to talk about this morning, and uh, it's something churches, like, we don't... It is so easy to avoid this topic because it is, it is challenging and it's something that is universal to the human experience. And it's the idea of strongholds, unhealthy strongholds in our lives. How do they get there? What are they? And how do we break free from them? So we're going to whet our appetite from the Bible this morning with those Area. So first, let's, let's jump right in. Um, we're going to be bouncing all over the Bible in the New Testament this morning. We don't have a single passage, so if you're one of the folks that likes to follow along, <laughs> do your best. Do your best, but I can't give you just one, one destination there. But right out the gate, we're going to talk about strongholds. <laughs> that's, a, that's sort of an intense word, like a stronghold, right? And so what is a stronghold? What, what, what's going on with that? Well, a stronghold would be like the Raiders' inability to win a playoff game. <laughs> oh. I'm a Niners fan, and so <laughs> I may have just buried them in their graves by that comment. Like, Jesus is like, well, okay then. Anyway. This is right out of the rooted experience. So part of that experience is a journal that we work through together, and it provides a really helpful definition of this challenging and sort of strange topic of, of strongholds. And it says it like this. A stronghold is more than sin. Satan has taken a natural desire or weakness in us. Now pause here. 
um, Satan's, the existence of Satan, the devil, and evil is something we assume here theologically at Bridge Church because that's what the Bible teaches. Uh, if that's something you wonder about, that, that's a topic for a different time, but we would love to engage with you on that. So reach out to us. Um, Satan has taken a natural desire or weakness in us, and listen to this. I love this language. It's so helpful. And supercharged it into something beyond our control. It's not something we can overcome on our own by trying really hard or being really good. A stronghold is a spiritual battle Satan is waging for our souls. The battle is fought in the spiritual realm and is beyond what we can fight on our own without the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's back up. How do we get there? Have you ever, have you ever had, <laughs> had a pattern of behavior or decision making or thinking or feeling or purchasing or eating or any of these things that was unhealthy in the moment you thought it was fantastic and, and perhaps it was meaningful and fulfilling and gratifying in the moment, but long term it only served to steal meaning and value from you and it was really unhealthy and destructive and dissolved your identity and sense of self-worth and those things. But no matter how much that trajectory that you had, you've discovered in your life is painful to look at, you keep going back to that thing. You keep making that decision. You keep run into that relationship. You keep putting that substance in your body, like whatever it is. Have you ever been there? Are you there now? Listen to what uh, the Bible says about this. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's the guy that God's Holy Spirit used, inspired to write the vast majority of the New Testament down. It says, I'd, and this is a super spiritual guy, right? Church planner and had much to do with the fact that we're all sitting here this morning and that God used him to launch the Christian movement after the resurrection of Jesus. And he says this, so I discover this law. When I want to do what's good, I find evil present within me instead. For in my inner self, I actually delight in God's law, his way. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law in my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin that's in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this situation? Thanks be to God, though, through Jesus Christ, he says. So then, he sums it up like this. With my mind, I'm serving God's law. I want the things and ways of God. But with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. The battle is real, right? Have you felt this? It's in all of us. It's universal to the human experience, and it's going on all the time. Where does it come from? Is it because we're broken beyond repair, or we just, we're not strong enough, or we're bad, or we're unfixable? Why is it that we can give our lives to Jesus and have the consequences and penalty for eternity for our foolishness and our sin be dealt with definitively and forever by Jesus and be given an invitation into his family eternally only to continue to wrestle with these uber destructive and dark and disgusting things within us and around us in an ongoing fashion, even after giving our lives to Jesus? What's with that? Listen to what 1 John chapter 2 says. Don't love the world or the things in the world. So the world has been broken by sin just like us, and there are really nasty parts of it because of it. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Whew, that's, a, that's a stiff statement, right? Why? For everything in the world, it says in 1 John chapter 16, excuse me, 1 John 2, 16, everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the, eye, the lust of the eyes and the pride in one's possessions, these things are not from the Father. They're from the world, and the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. <laughs> the world, right? It is full of shiny, fancy, neat, and momentarily fulfilling things that are tempting, is it not? What is lust? Lust is an inordinately strong desire for something, may or may not be bad, but oftentimes what happens is that morphs into a craving for something that is either forbidden or something that will give us a momentary pleasure but will end up stealing from us in the long term. 
Maybe it steals our meaning or our purpose or our sense of self. The understanding that we're a beloved daughter or son of God made in his image. It's something that gives us, it it grants a desire or a wish in the moment, but in the long term, it destroys us. The world is full of things like that. The lust of the flesh the craving for a physical experience that will, that will fulfill a longing I have, that will fulfill a void I have, that will take care of a deficiency I feel, that will take the fact that I, I desire physical intimacy, something God has built into each human to be expressed in the context of healthy, committed marriage and twists it out of control and we pursue it so that we can have what we feel to be a void or deficiency in ourselves filled and we do that over and over again and each time we try and fill the void we find that our attempted filling of the void only deepens it. Oh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, desiring what we do not and cannot have. Oh man, this is a biggie in the culture in which we live today. It is so easy to see the best of what's around. (laughs) The highly curated by super fancy algorithm posts we scroll through. The highly curated and mostly wildly fake lives people post of themselves with their highly edited photos. It is so easy the lust of the flesh, craving what we do not and cannot have that leads us into patterns of thinking and believing that we are not enough and that we will not be until we get there with that person and that thing and we're able to have it and control it. And and the more we grasp and the more we go after it and the more we attempt to control, the more we find we are out of control. The lust of the eyes. Pride in one's possessions, confident... It's not talking about the possessions themselves. It's talking about pride and our ability to manufacture stuff and life and security for ourselves. My ability, my strength, my intelligence, my status, my role. Confidence in that rather than confidence in Jesus. The world is full of these things, friends. And listen... They all, listen to this, they they all promise to give you something you want that will fulfill you, but all they ever end up actually doing is taking from you. And each time we say yes to them instead of no, we find that the hole we were attempting to fill gets bigger. And over the course of time, we say yes to some sort of physical lust. We say yes to the lust of the eyes, to greed and to arrogance. We say yes to trusting in ourselves rather than the Holy Spirit. And over the course of weeks and months and years, we look back and what we see, what we see is destruction. That is where strongholds come from. See, every time we decide to say yes to the lust of the flesh or the lust of our eyes or the pride in ourselves, and we string those yeses up over the course of time, we are transferring authority and control in that area of our life over to the enemy. Because we are saying no to the way we are designed to do it, God's way, the way of Jesus, and we are saying yes to the way the enemy wants us to do it, knowing that with every yes, we are further from the path of God in our lives than we were before we said yes. And soon we're no longer in control in that area of our life. Friends, the battle, it's not just physical. This is a spiritual battle. Listen to what Ephesians says. For our struggle, it's not against flesh and blood. (laughs) How, How much easier would it be if it was just against flesh and blood? If we could always see it, we could always feel it, we could always touch it and attempt to control it and know exactly where it is and what it's doing and where it's coming from, but it's not. This is a spiritual battle. We don't struggle against flesh and blood We struggle against rulers and authorities, the cosmic powers of darkness and evil, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There is a physical reality, friends, and then there is a spiritual reality. And in the spiritual reality, every single day, a war is being waged for your life. That's why 2 Corinthians says, although we live in the flesh, we don't actually wage war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the physical But they are spiritual and they're powerful through, listen to this, I love this, they're powerful through God for the demolition of 
strongholds, those areas in our lives where we have said yes, and Satan has taken them because we are transferring with every yes authority in that area away from Jesus and to Satan, and he has supercharged them into something beyond our control. But with God, there is power for the demolition of these strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Friends, to follow Jesus is to break down the strongholds in our lives. There there can be no extended, prolonged obedience to Jesus, following in the footsteps of Jesus while we continue to attempt to follow him while being hindered by constant strongholds in our lives. Lives. Yes, we are saved for eternity, but we are living in brokenness. To follow Jesus is to break down the strongholds in our lives. So I have a question for you this morning. Where are you not in your life, in your life, where are you not in control of something that you used to be in control of? Where are you no longer in control of something where you used to be in control of it? There's your stronghold right there. There are some obvious ones like alcohol, drugs, sexual desire gone completely insane. But there are some others that we don't talk about as much. Relational codependency, needing someone more than we need Jesus. Food, Money, pride, anger, self-righteousness, the appearance of living one way. There are so many areas where we can say yes to the wrong things. And pretty soon we find an area of supercharged weakness into something that we thought we could control. We we justify it in our minds and we think, I can stop this whenever I want. (laughs) I can go whatever direction whenever I want only to find that every time we try to do that, we find the war within ourselves, our heart and our mind desiring us to say no, to go a new direction, and yet we go the same unhealthy direction again. It's a stronghold. When I was a college student at Fresno State, I had a stronghold of pornography in my life. (laughs) I was uh, part of the college group here at this church And I was like leading worship and I was on the leadership team and there was a lot of appearances in my life that suggested that everything was moving in a great direction. Yes, Jeff's sins are forgiven. He's given his life to Jesus and he's growing and maturing and learning how to lead and serve the church and all these things. And yet in my own life, I was structuring my day and my class schedule and my work schedule to ensure that I had extended chunks of time by myself in my apartment to look at porn. It's a stronghold, friends. All the while, my mind was justifying, I can choose to behave in any fashion I want at any time. No, because every time I tried, the grip of the stronghold only tightened. So I want to ask you this morning, where are you feeling like you think you can control something that you maybe can't control? The good news is the Bible clearly says we have power through God for the demolition of these areas in our lives. There is a way forward. Now, one of the reasons we are so excited about this 10-week rooted experience is because we are better together. One of our values here at Bridge Church is community. And the way we describe that is that we're better together. God built us to do things on our own. Friends, you can, everything we're gonna look at in the next few minutes, how to break through a stronghold. You can attempt to do things, these things on your own without community around you. It's not likely to succeed. You need community. You need a tribe with you because this, friends, this will be the most difficult thing you probably ever do. So how do we do that? There's three things. First is this. We got to be honest and we got to confess. First John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is righteous to forgive us our sins. And listen to this, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
You can be honest with it about the stronghold with yourself and with God because he is faithful, he is righteous, he executes justice, and he will take everything <laughs> that you've been trying to hide from him that he already knows, that you've been trying to hide from yourself, and when you write it down and say it out loud and exercise complete honesty and confess, God, I have, I have a stronghold in, it is, I, I cannot control, I confess that I am not able to overcome and I need your help because I am stuck and I've tried and I am not in control of, the foundation of the stronghold begins to crack. And God takes that confession and he wipes away the unrighteousness. He cleanses you from the unrighteousness. Friends, when I was in college dealing with this stronghold in my life, it, was only, it only began to be broken when I was 100% brutally embarrassingly, shamefully honest with it about myself and with God. Like writing it out in front of you. I encourage you to do this this week. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it. Some of us, when I asked that question earlier, where are you no longer in control that you used to be? You already know where the stronghold is this morning. Write it out this week. I am stuck because I am whatever it is. Say it out loud to yourself and to God. I can not do it. I've tried. I confess. I'm stuck. Honesty and confession. And then we move to surrender and repentance. See, Acts chapter 3, this is such a beautiful, beautiful statement here. Acts chapter 3, it says, repent and turn back to God so that your sins may be wiped out. There it is again. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sins being wiped out. Why do you suppose we're finding that in all of these verses? Because the Holy Spirit, God through the Holy Spirit inspiring this to be written in the Bible, they know how much that we as humans deal with shame and guilt. We need to be constantly reminded that because of Jesus, we are enough and we are not permanently broken and we are never too far gone. So that your sins may be wiped out, repent, turn back to God that seasons, I love it, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he would send you Jesus who has been appointed for you. <laughs> we get brutally honest about the stronghold with ourselves and before God, and then we decide, I am going to stop walking, literally Stop deciding, literally. Stop spending money like that, literally. Stop behaving sexually in that way, literally. Stop eating or drinking or putting that into my body, literally. And I am going to literally, deliberately, actively walk in a new direction. That is the definition of repentance. And guess what? With the deliberate action to say, enough is enough. I am walking in a completely different direction. It is in that turning and that first, second, third step that seasons of refreshing begin in our lives and the presence of God comes into our lives again in a fresh way and wipes out the shame and the guilt and begins the work of breaking even further the cracks in the foundation of that stronghold. And now the, the building above the foundation, the walls are beginning to crack and the roof is beginning to shake. Surrender and repentance. Man, my, my stronghold with pornography it was only broken when I chose to literally walk away from it. <laughs> you know what that looked like in my life? And this was really difficult to do, wildly inconvenient as an honor student at Fresno, Fresno State at the time. I took all of my computers, all of my electronic devices, anything that gave me access to the internet, and I literally handed it over to a trusted friend to get it out of my apartment Overnight And during the daytime, there was always accountability as to where I was and what I was doing. It was humiliating. But the roof and the foundation and stronghold was starting to collapse. And then I got to a point where I was like, I see the roof shaking. It's starting to collapse. Freedom is coming. And then I'd get stuck and slide back a little bit. Ah, and then I'd try and muscle my way, Right? That's so strong in us. It's so strong in us. If you just try harder, if you work harder, you can do it. But it, I realized I didn't, I didn't have enough in me. And that's where the last part comes, and it's accountability. 
We cannot do this on our own. Confess your sins to one another, James 5.16 says, and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Healing comes when we break strongholds together because we can't break them on our own. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Friends, like the stronghold was broken for real in my life when I gathered my small little tribe of Jesus following men in college and spilled the beans on the entire disgusting situation of my stronghold and said, I'm stuck. I can't do it. I've confessed. I'm attempting to repent and walk a new way. But guess what? I need you to pray. I need you to ask me. I need you to not worry about embarrassing me. I need you to keep me accountable to this. I even went so far as talking about it with the woman I wanted to marry. And that friends, was the most humiliating experience of my entire life to date. And it was in that the stronghold finally collapsed. Accountability ultimately brings freedom. <laughs> Honesty with ourselves and with God about the reality of the situation. The out of controlness and stuckness and then we confess it and we repent and we do whatever is necessary, even if it is wildly inconvenient. Maybe some of us do need to take our phone and give them to someone else overnight. I know that's not realistic. Do it anyway. And then we need to tell somebody about it this week. Say so the only way we're going to make it through this, the only way I'm going to be free is if you walk with me into freedom. That's why we're talking so much about rooted groups. We have to do this together. We can try it on our own, but then we're going to try it again on our own. And then we're going to try it again on our own. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that in the one another, healing may come. Friends, these strongholds, they're no joke. And we have all experienced them. We know what it is like. We know the taste and the feel and the smell and the emotions of them. And some of us this morning are still the strongest grip in our life is the grip of the stronghold. The way forward for you is to begin living this out and to get yourself into a rooted group for some help and some accountability. We spent a lot of time, most of our time this morning in the Bible talking about strongholds, and that was on purpose because they are such an epic and destructive thing for us, even after we've given our life to Jesus and our sins are forgiven and we've been given entry into the family of God and eternity with him. The strongholds can still mess with every area of our lives. But there's another thing we need to talk about this morning as we round out our time together. Another critical element to following Jesus and it's serving. Friends, to follow Jesus is to serve others. Perhaps one of the most critical ways, <laughs> uh, reasons to be freed of stronghold is not for the benefit to us and to the honoring of God that comes, comes in the freedom of stronghold in our life, but it frees us up to be able to do what we're designed to do, and that's to serve others with our lives. So there's, there's so many passages all over the Bible, and especially in the New Testament, that we could look at, but I want to look at the life of Jesus. We find Jesus calling us to serve his disciples, other followers of Jesus. It says in John chapter 13, Jesus knew that his hour had come. The end was about to come for him, and he knew this, to depart from the world and head to the Father. Having loved his own, his disciples, his followers, who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. Now, when it was time for dinner, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> These big, sweeping, beautiful theological statements. Jesus loved them to the end. And then it was dinner time. <laughs> I love the Bible. It's just, it's so epic and so down to earth at the same time. Now, when it was time for dinner, the devil had already put it into the heart of a man named Judas. He was Simon Iscariot's son to betray Jesus, to be the human element of the undoing of the earthly life of Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands. Jesus knew that he had the authority and the power, that he had come from God. He was confident in who he was, 
and that he was going back to God, he knew what his mission was. So think about that. Jesus is full of the the authority and power of God. He's confident in his identity, and he's ready to, to take hold, to finish all the way to the end with his death, the mission God gave him to accomplish here on earth. Now, think about all the things he could do and say in that moment. What a pivotal moment. What an epic moment. What a trajectory, history changing moment at this otherwise totally normal dinner. And what does he decide to do? He got up from dinner, he took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and he poured water in a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel around his waist. Washing feet was the work of a servant, lowly, bottom-tier servant. This was a warm climate where people were wandering around in sandals, often in disgusting environments. Feet were gross. It was reserved for folks who had zero class and status. That's the kind of job this is. And of all the things Jesus could do, knowing what he knew about himself and the fact that God's plan for him in relation to humanity was coming to its climax, what does he do? He serves, and not just that. The teacher was serving the students. This was mind-boggling at this time in the world. The fully bought-in one was serving the marginally bought-in at best. They were following Jesus at this point because it was fun and fancy and brought them prestige. (laughs) The one who loved fully to the very end was serving those who wouldn't even be able to follow fully to the end. The scriptures teach us that many of these guys deserted Jesus at one point after the going got tough. He served him. The Lord, the master, was serving the one who would betray him. And it goes on to say, when Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he went to the table again and said to them, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, Lord is master. And you are speaking correctly since that is what I am. Yet if I, your Lord and master, your master and your teacher have washed your feet, if I have done this, you also ought to wash one another's feet. One another, disciples, other followers of Jesus. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. Jesus, friends, he, here, he tells us straight up right here to follow me is to serve other followers of me. Service is one of our values here at Bridge Church, and this is why the way we describe it is Jesus served us so we serve others. So I want to ask you this morning, how are you serving others here at Bridge Church? Do you have someone that you're serving consistently? A serve team, perhaps. I can tell you without a doubt as the leader of the creative team, I'd love to have you serve on our creative team. I talk with Pastor Nick daily. I know that there's awesome spots on the Hello team, greeting people and helping them find a place and take their next. There is so many places to serve other followers of Jesus here at Bridge Church. And to follow Jesus is to do just that. And we're not asking that you would do something from now until the end of time. If you're not serving, just jump in and try it from like now till summer. But that's not all. See, Jesus absolutely calls us with his life and his words to serve other followers of Jesus. He also calls us to serve those outside of the church, folks who are not yet followers of Jesus, folks who have no idea who Jesus is or are even hostile to him and the idea that he would be Lord of their lives and they would need saving by him. For even the Son of Man, Mark 10, 45 says, did not come to be served, but to serve The point of Jesus' life, entry into this world as a man. Why would he do that? To serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here we find the whole point. The point was to serve those who did not yet love him. That's what we find in, in a passage like Philippians 2. It can say something like this. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. How beautiful. He had the authority and he chose to lay it down anyway. Instead, he emptied himself. 
assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, by serving the needs of others. What was the most pivotal and foundational need of people who don't know God, to know God and to be saved by him. Jesus became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, so that that could happen. (laughs) Jesus served in the ultimate way. He served people who didn't love him and who wouldn't ever love him. People who didn't acknowledge him and wouldn't ever acknowledge him. People who didn't want anything to do with him, even people who were openly hostile to him and everything in between. These are all people Jesus served. And so the question for us, friends, as followers of Jesus, who are we serving and how are we serving them? Folks who don't yet know Jesus and perhaps don't even want anything to do with him at this point. Maybe it's to ease the burden of a coworker or a neighbor or a family member who doesn't know Jesus, who's stuck in a hard way, and you have the ability to help with that in some fashion. Or maybe it's to sponsor a child overseas who doesn't know Jesus yet through our partnership with Compassion International and be involved in them coming to know Jesus and the transformation of their lives. It, it, it could be so many things. Friends, to follow Jesus is to serve others. And to follow Jesus is to break down the strongholds in our lives and rooted. This is why we are so excited about this, because together we have the opportunity this spring at Bridge Church to experience a new and fresh level of transformation. Imagine your life, this church with less strongholds. There is a way forward. Imagine each and every one of us knowing exactly how we're wired up and what we can contribute to the family of God and to the world outside of it, deciding to serve in those ways. Imagine what would happen this year. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for the example of your life. I thank you that in your name and in your authority, There is power for the demolition of strongholds. And then there is a way forward into freedom in your name. And there is an example as to how we are to order our lives for the service of your people and humanity so that our lives are indeed as meaningful and as purposeful as you have promised they would be when we give them to you. May we choose it this week, Jesus. And as we do, may your Holy Spirit empower us in a fresh way. And it is in your name that we ask these things. Amen.